Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Yaroslav Shulatov. I'm Associate Professor at the School of Political Science and Economics, Russell University. Uh, thank you very much for joining today's event. Uh, this seminar is organized by the Slavic Eurasian Research Center, Hokkaido University, Institute for Russian East European Studies, Vassal University, and the Japanese Society for the Study of Russian History, Rosashi Kenkyukai. Uh, we are happy to greet the participants from all around Japan, as well as from Russia, Ukraine, Europe, China, United States, and other regions of the world. Um, I'm having a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Grigory Yudin. Uh, Greg is a professor of uh, political philosophy at the Moscow School of uh, Social and Economic Sciences, also known as Shaninka. Uh, his research focuses on the political theory of democracy with an emphasis on public opinion polling. Uh, Greg is one of the leading specialists in this field, and he plays a very important and a very active role in explaining what is going on in the Russian society after the invasion to Ukraine on uh, February 24. Uh, I would like the audience uh, to pay special attention to the Greg's article, which came out right before the war got uh, started on February 23. Uh, in that paper, Greg not only argues uh, that the war was inevitable, uh, but also quite accurately predicted how the Russian society would face the war uh, and how it would react. Uh, the English title is uh, Putin is about to start the most senseless war in history. You can find it online uh, at the Open Democracy resource. Uh, the Russian title is Эта война будет самой бессмысленной сихой нашей истории. Uh, вы тоже можете найти uh, на сайте Open Democracy. Uh, we have translated this paper into Japanese, and you can find this translation on the event homepage, the Slavic Research Center homepage. Конорунко ваякува это сорока но и бенто на хомпеджи не апсарит труваки дари масте. Нихонго го кибо но ката ва это сори о это аксесисте даунродо сте дозу имена таку да сай. Let me also introduce our respected commentator, discussant, Professor Kimita Kamatsuzato. Uh, he is the professor of uh, the Great School for Law and Politics, the University of Tokyo. Um, Professor Matsuzato is one of the leading scholars on Russia and Japan uh, with a wide range of research interests, including history, political science, post Soviet space, and so on. Uh, as for the timetable, uh, Greg will uh, give his talk for around 40 45 minutes. Then we will have uh, the comments of Professor Matsuzato, around 10 minutes roughly. And then we will have QA session. Uh, please send your comments, your questions to the QA forum. Uh, please do not forget to mention your name and affiliation. It could be just independent scholar, student, whatever you want. Uh, we generally accept the questions in English. Uh, но если будут вопросы на русском, тоже постараемся их затронуть. Uh, все участники мероприятия uh, uh, говорят на русском. Ма не хонгу мо, дошите мо не хонгу на гости мо гариба. Канона кагири тайю читаю то мой мас кири тому магенцоку то что и годы его нагаюсь таку мой мас. Unfortunately, we cannot guarantee that we will read and answer all the questions, but we will do our best. That, that's what I can guarantee. Um, the title of our event is uh, Do Russians Support Putin? Uh, this is a part of the paper, uh, which will come out soon uh, from the Journal of Democracy. Uh, although the significant part of uh, the audience, I assume, I include myself, is particularly interested in what do uh, Russians think about war now? Uh, about Putin's support under the, circum, uh, the current uh, circumstances. It is also extremely important to understand uh, the nature of uh, the Putin's regime in the historical perspective. And Greg uh, draws quite interesting analogies with France and Germany in the past. So we are all uh, looking forward to hear it. And cannot wait to hear your presentation, Greg. Please get started. Uh, thank you, Yaroslav. <clears throat> thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be uh, talking at this event. Um, I will uh, try to uh, provide you with uh, my view of the situation, but more generally of the trajectory that uh, Russian political system has taken. Uh, I must um, emphasize uh, that uh, I'm not a Russia scholar. Uh, Russia is not my uh, academic interest. I'm not doing Russian studies, Slavic studies. Uh, so actually, 
I'm not the Russia guy. Uh, I'm doing political theory. Uh, I'm doing political philosophy. And in that respect, Russia uh, comes uh, into play because I think Russia is a very interesting um, case illustrating many tendencies, important tendencies that we can observe in present day democracies. Uh, so this is uh, the way I, I approach uh, Russia, even though I would perhaps be happy to answer your specific questions if they will deal with, uh, with Russia. Uh, to the extent, of course, my knowledge will help me. Uh, let me turn on the presentation. Can you can you see it? Yeah, it works. Perfect. Perfect. Right. <clears throat> so. Uh, yep. Well, let us uh, start with the. Uh, uh, place the discussion of uh, Russia stake in, in the political science. And this is also a discussion that uh, overflows uh, political science uh, and uh, is quite common uh, among the general uh, public. Uh, so Russia presents to a certain extent some, some sort of riddle. Uh, and we can see it uh, in uh, what is now, of course, been uh, much ta talked about uh, in the levels of support for what, what in Russia is officially called the special military operation, and also for uh, the skyrocketing, um, skyrocketing ratings of the Russian president. Uh, so this, this is something that's been widely discussed uh, all over the world, obviously, because Russia started this uh, war and now everyone is interested uh, basically in uh, who is the subject of this war, uh, who is waging this war. Is it the Russian government uh, or the Russian people? Uh, is there any sort of cleavage between them? And this is how people come across those uh, numbers uh, indicating that is uh, a very high level of support for both war and the, and the president. Uh, and then, of course, the question is, how should it be interpreted? Should we immediately jump to the conclusion that uh, it is not Putin's war, but uh, Russia's war? Actually, uh, Russians stand firm behind uh, the president uh, and uh, participate in this uh, war, um, become complicit uh, in it. So my uh, my answer to that would be that context matters, uh, context matters a lot. Uh, and I will try to show in this talk how exactly we should uh, perceive these, uh, these numbers. And this is why we have this, uh, this riddle of Russia, because <clears throat> actually how we interpret these numbers to a very significant extent depends on what kind of regime uh, do we do, what kind of political regime do we have in, uh, in Russia. And of the... Uh, last, uh, I would say, two decades, a number of uh, qualifications uh, were introduced, such as electoral authoritarianism, competitive authoritarianism, hybrid regimes, a whole theory of hybrid regimes, of course, in political science, mainstream political science, but also a liberal democracy, and then my favorite, democratic authoritarianism. Basically, all of them, as you can see, kind of uh, tend to um, emphasize that this, this is... Um, a midpoint, uh, a midpoint between two extremes. Well, normally in mainstream political science, of course, the, those two extremes are democracy and authoritarianism. And then the idea is that this is this is a midway between democracy and authoritarianism. But somehow um, the regimes like Russian, uh, they get, get stuck at this uh, midpoint and uh, they develop uh, a uh, quite peculiar um, design, uh, which uh, demonstrates those signs of hybridity. Uh, well, why actually do we need to those, those qualifications? Uh, well, the issue uh, is the, the conceptual issue is the elections, uh, because uh, this is what um, doesn't allow us uh, to dub those regimes, like the Russian regime, um, outright authoritarian, because they do have elections. They do have elections, and that means that they have uh, a democratic component. Um, historically, they tend to introduce elections, uh, striving for evolution into liberal democracy, but that, once again, they get stuck, and this is how they develop this hybridity. Uh, so the elections uh, is a minimal 
prerequisite for you know, for democracy, and this is why you have uh, uh, a combined uh, a combined sort of uh, regime here. Uh, one uh, important observation here is that um, you might assume that uh, in that kind of design, elections would turn into a sort of uh, necessary evil, perhaps a window dressing, uh, signaling the uh, the order world that this is uh, this is a democracy, while um, despising democracy, of course, internally. But this is not the case. Rather than treating elections as a necessary evil, a Russian regime um, actually is very enthusiastic about elections and shows peculiar electoral enthusiasm, uh, meaning that elections perform a key function in the system. And in this talk, I will um, elaborate on what kind of uh, function is that. Uh, now, how can we see it? Not only uh, in the fact that elections are not suppressed in Russia, but also in the fact that actually uh, elections are quite regular in Russia and just as it happens in uh, um, liberal democracies, um, the political life is organized around elections. So those are key institutions in both the United States, Germany, Russia, so no, no difference here. Uh, there was some sort of suppression of uh, elections on the um, local level. Uh, most of uh, city mayors are now not elected, uh, the vast majority of them are now not, not elected, but uh, appointed. But otherwise, uh, all sorts of elections are there. General elections, uh, presidential elections, parliamentary elections, uh, governors are uh, elected, uh, state, uh, sorry, uh, regional councils, uh, but also local elections, so a whole lot of elections. But this is not all, because uh, beside elections, uh, you also have uh, plebiscites in Russia, just as it happened in <clears throat> 2020 with the famous uh, <clears throat> plebiscite on constitutional amendments. Uh, but this is uh, also supplemented very importantly by uh, constant opinion polling that plays a very important uh, role in, in Russian political design. Uh, the poll numbers are regularly being regularly reported and basically treated as uh, constant, uh, as a sort of a constant plebiscite. Uh, showing that uh, between the, the electoral points, the support doesn't, doesn't really uh, decrease. And those opinion polls are sometimes even integrated into the functioning of the constitutional system, just as it happened in 2014 with uh, the famous uh, mega poll uh, on Crimea, which actually substituted for, um, for a national referendum when Crimea was annexed. So effectively became uh, part, of, uh, part of Russian Federation. Uh, and since there was obviously no uh, possibility to uh, conduct a real referendum as demanded by Russian constitution, it was, um, the, the, this function was accomplished by this huge opinion poll representative of, uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> the whole spectrum of uh, Russian regions with the sample of uh, nearly 50,000 delivered in just three days. Uh, Created technological breakthrough. Uh, so these things, they play a very important role in Russia rather than being uh, marginal, uh, necessary evil, they are actually the core of Russian political system. Um, and then, of course, uh, on top of that, you also have uh, technological, uh, technological progress. Uh, actually, Russia now becomes the most advanced country in terms of electronic voting. Uh, and uh, if the presidential election is going to be held according to the schedule in 2024, this is definitely going to be the record-breaking uh, electoral event with, uh, with the e-vote. Uh, so that uh, actually many uh, people in the US uh, would be envious about uh, Russia with all the, all the trouble with <clears throat> those uh, votes sent out uh, by uh, mail. Uh, 
uh, of course, they would uh, question why wouldn't we just uh, do the same thing as Russians do? Why wouldn't we switch to uh, to e-voting? You also have voting apps uh, in in Russia in several cities, I would say. Uh, so, for instance, in Moscow, where I'm talking from now, uh, the citizens are uh, encouraged to uh, download and install the application called the Active Citizen, uh, where <clears throat> some <clears throat> issues uh, pertaining to the, uh, the the local agenda are being uh, decided through voting. Um, so uh, judging on that, um, I mean, if you only look at this voting enthusiasm, the perception might be that Russia is actually not only a democracy, but also uh, one of probably the most advanced democracies. This is the claim which is often being made by uh, by Russian officials. Uh, but that only applies if we identify democracy with voting, which uh, is actually very problematic from the uh, viewpoint of political theory. Now, my argument in the remainder of this talk would be that uh, Russia actually presents a plebiscitarian regime, uh, a regime where uh, the legitimacy is derived from plebiscites and uh, where elections and voting are instrumentalized to empower uh, an almighty uh, absolute uh, personal ruler. Let me tell you a bit more about the plebiscitarian design. So the political theory of plebiscitarianism was developed uh, in the uh, interwar uh, period, so between the World War I and World War II, mainly by the Germans, uh, uh, such as Max Weber and uh, Karl Schmidt, um, and also Josef Schumpeter, who was an Austrian, but uh, very uh, much influenced by, uh, by both Weber and Schmidt. Uh, and but also by some uh, American theorists like Walter Liebman. I will probably pay more attention in this talk to, uh, to the German theory. Uh, Schumpeter is of course important here because uh, our common definition of uh, democracy um, actually goes back to, to Schumpeter. It is now called the theory, uh, the minimalist theory of democracy, a theory of minimal democracy by which democracy is identified as a regime where uh, the ruling elites are uh, gaining their uh, powers through uh, through elections. Uh, so this uh, this connection between the plebiscitarian tradition and this uh, mainstream uh, definition of democracy is uh, really important. Um, well, the idea uh, of those theorists was uh, that um, a really responsible and uh, robust political regime should be a combination. Uh, Weber uh, portrayed it as a combination between two uh, different types of legitimacy. There's a charismatic legitimacy uh, embodied in the leader, but also the legal rational reg legitimacy embodied in parliament and bureaucracy. Weber's concern was uh, with parliamentary democracy. He didn't believe that the parliamentary democracy is an is embodiment of uh, legal rationality, as an embodiment of uh, uh, liberal thought, cannot actually deliver uh, because it cannot produce the responsible rulers. Uh, it is always driven um, by uh, internal strife, internal conflict between parties, between uh, special interests. So it needs um, someone to be on top of, of the of, of the system. And that would be the leader who would derive his uh, legitimacy not from the parliamentary system, but from directly from the people, become the charismatic leader uh, who has a different source of legitimacy, different, different from, uh, from the parliament and, and bureaucracy. And then both parliament and bureaucracy become uh, kind of part of his apparatus uh, because he takes the responsibility for the decisions and uh, those other parts of system, they uh, are responsible for implementing those uh, those decisions. Uh, it actually led to a specific design of the German constitution, 
the so-called Weimar Constitution of 1919, and Weber was uh, very active uh, in promoting this constitution. He was actually part of the Constitutional Committee, uh, drafting the constitution. Uh, and in this committee, he uh, insisted on creating this uh, position of the strong leader, the president, uh, first president in German history. Uh, so strong leader would have a democratic legitimacy and also extraordinary powers. So he could always intervene into a normal functioning of the political system, uh, suspend the, the normality and uh, take the responsibility for the course uh, of, the, of the nation. Uh, Schmidt would later uh, upgrade and also modify this uh, theory. So for Schmidt, uh, actually plebiscitary democracy was uh, a synthesis of democracy and monarchy. He had uh, a peculiar theory of democracy, uh, claiming also that uh, real democracy is not possible. It also always requires uh, a monarch to embody the popular will. So uh, that's why the Weimar system should be interpreted as a combination of democracy and monarchy. And I emphasize the word synthesis here, because this is very different from the um, midpoint view uh, that I mentioned earlier. Rather than uh, looking at this system uh, as, a, as a midpoint, as some somewhat imperfect uh, state or imperfect condition between two extremes, the point is to look at it as deliberately produced synthetic uh, combination which is uh, actually um, very robust and rigid precisely because it is uh, uh, well, uh, well planned and uh, well thought uh, constitutional design. Uh, so it is uh, not, only, not only it is not imperfect, but it is uh, deliberately made uh, perfect uh, and, uh, and robust. Um, now, of course, uh, in this system, you have domination of the executive because all uh, magistrates are subordinated to the president and uh, the independence uh, of the parliament or the constitutional court uh, is uh, obviously fictional because the whole design presumes that the responsibility for the country should be concentrated in one specific point, uh, actually on the top. Uh, for that reason, uh, the independence of uh, other authorities is very, very limited. Uh, they basically become part of the presidential apparatus. Most importantly, uh, under this system, uh, the elections uh, tend to function as acclamation. Well, the word comes from the ancient Rome, uh, from Roman Republic, but mostly from the uh, Roman Empire where actually the emperor's uh, decrees uh, were publicly announced on the streets and met with uh, vocal, strong vocal acclamation by the people, meaning that uh, actually the legitimacy of uh, those, uh, those decrees was formally derived from the people and not from the emperor, uh, because uh, the, the approval uh, expressed uh, by the people through acclamation was the uh, the ultimate uh, ground on on which uh, the legitimacy of those decrees was based even though it was completely obvious that it was the emperor of course who was making the decision and not the not the people uh, whose function was to to acclaim now weber's but also schmidt's uh, idea was that uh, actually in uh, present day in contemporary democracies liberal democracies, elections function precisely as an acclamation, uh, meaning that uh, when the uh, voters come to the polling stations, they are not uh, making a rational choice, um, estimating or assessing who would better represent their uh, views or their preferences, but rather facing uh, the decision already made by the ruler who now requires an acclamation from them. Well, in the pragmatic case of the election, you would find uh, a number of, uh, of, of the names on the ballot, uh, but you are supposed to acclaim to the, the incumbent who is the leader and who requires your acclamation in order to, uh, keep, in order to keep going. Uh, 
so this is a very different view of the meaning of uh, elections as uh, a political process, which is shared by all those participating in it, uh, both the politicians, the candidates, the voters, and also, of course, those who do the machinery of the voting, those who uh, do the campaigning, uh, the vote counting, etc. Uh, so the election becomes the vote of confidence and is understood so by the electorate. Mm, importantly, of course, the settings for a plebiscite uh, are always determined by the leader himself. So it is the leader who decides when the election will be held, what would be the wording, uh, or uh, in case of, of an actual election, what would be the list of candidates who is allowed to, to be on the ballot, what are the rules for uh, voting, but also for counting? So those are the decisions made by the leader. Uh, the outcome, of course, under these circumstances is predetermined. Uh, and nobody really doubts that uh, the, the outcome is uh, already known. Uh, but the, the idea is not to make the decisions through plebiscite, but to validate the ready-made decisions, because they need this uh, popular validation. Uh, and then, of course, the acclamation requires a supermajority, uh, because it is only when there's the whole people behind the leader uh, that the leader can uh, rely on this uh, popular legitimacy. At the same time, interesting, participation, participation is generally discouraged, because, uh, and we can see it uh, in, in Weber's uh, initial idea, well, uh, all those theorists were quite skeptical about the popular rule. Uh, they were quite skeptical about the ability of the people to actually uh, deliver. Uh, this is why they needed this um, single leader who would take the responsibility for the whole country when uh, the people is uh, massing in politics too much. It actually only does harm uh, to, to the nation. Uh, so it is uh, it would be better to discourage people from participating uh, the only role they have to perform is to show up uh, at the plebiscitarian uh, moments and produce the supermajority on which the leader would uh, then uh, rely in his actions. Um, well, uh, already uh, by, uh, by the time when this theory was developed, there were historical precedents of this kind of regime. Uh, two main historical precedents uh, were mm, the Second Republic, which would later mm, become Second Empire in France uh, in 1848 uh, to 1870. Uh, and the key word back then was the Caesarism. Um, so uh, Louis Bonaparte, uh, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, who was elected the first French president in 1848 after the revolution and would later um, implement uh, a constitutional coup and become the French uh, emperor. He was himself a, a theorist of, of Caesarism uh, and uh, in, uh, in his book on, on, on Caesarism, it was also called Bonapartism uh, back then. So in his book, uh, he described this combination of monarchy and popular sovereignty uh, as a mix of democratic equality and hierarchical order. So once again, the idea is to combine something which uh, we tend to see as uh, two opposite extremes, but here they are not simply uh, reconciled with each other, but also combined so that each of them takes their functional place in this uh, design. Of course, this is a monarchy with a strong leader and absolute powers, but it relies on the, the idea of popular sovereignty. Uh, the legitimacy is derived not from, um, from inheritance, it's not a hereditary monarchy, but from uh, the will of, of the people. And of course, Napoleon was quite successful beside the this election of 1848 which was a huge surprise of course for all the republicans they didn't expect um, napoleon who was of course a clone uh, to them uh, didn't expect him to win but then he uh, turned out to be uh, much more persistent than he had, than they expected accomplished this um, coup in 1851 and 52 
with also with two plebiscites, and then was ruling through uh, through this plebiscitary legitimacy, uh, which was also derived from a whole system of local elections, which were producing legitimacy for the official uh, for the officials uh, handpicked uh, by by Napoleon III's administration. Uh, so basically, it was a lot of uh, elections going on in France all the time, and, uh, and all of them, there would be one candidate handpicked by Napoleon. Uh, the whole administrative apparatus would be crazy about making this, about getting this um, candidate uh, elected. He would uh, get, he would campaign uh, on showing his uh, proximity to Napoleon, uh, would uh, distribute uh, the evidence of uh, this, the personal support from, from Napoleon. Napoleon III, and they would normally win, even though not always, but normally uh, those uh, Bonapartist candidates, they would win, uh, and they would, uh, in, by that way, uh, further contribute to Napoleon's own uh, legitimacy in an indirect way. So it was never at stake uh, directly at those elections, but in indirect way, uh, in indirect way uh, those little uh, victories for those candidates contributed to his uh, own legitimacy. And then you have, of course, a uh, second major um, case in point, uh, the Weimar Republic, which would also later turn uh, Third Empire. Uh, in Germany, well, that's that's a common thing about republics. Uh, they tend to gradually uh, di dissolve uh, into empires without that being recognized. Uh, never happened uh, in in Germany, of course, because the Third Reich uh, was formally only a continuation of, of the Weimar Republic. The Weimar Republic was never uh, never ended uh, officially until the until the end of the war. Uh, and uh, it was, of course, uh, very much uh, under the influence of this infamous Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution, the article which, uh, as I mentioned, was promoted, uh, among others, by Max Weber, and which gave uh, extraordinary uh, powers to the president. And the president obviously uh, abused these powers, and this is how uh, the National Socialist Party came to power because they never won uh, the the election in such a way as to uh, get the um, the democratic majority. Uh, so instead of uh, winning the democratic majority, which was impossible for the Nazi, uh, they actually took the constitutional uh, path. Uh, they uh, pressed uh, President Paul von Hindenburg uh, into appointing uh, Hitler uh, the chancellor. Uh, in January 1933, and then Hitler himself would uh, abuse, of course, this Article uh, 48 uh, very much. Mm, and there were also plebiscites, uh, so there was a very common thing both on the Weimar Republic and uh, after the the uh, Machtergreifung, uh, so the the um, they come to power of the Nazis. Well, I, I even have here the actual ballot. You can see it on the right, the actual ballot. Um, <clears throat> uh, this one uh, is about the, the annexation of, uh, of the Austria, uh, of Austria. Uh, so this, this was the ballot uh, distributed to, to, the, uh, to the Austrians uh, during the annexation. And uh, importantly, well, there are two interesting things here. Well, first, of course, you can see uh, the, the meeting uh, of, the, uh, of the ballot. Uh, of course, you are uh, expected to say yes and, and, and not uh, the other way around. And it is even emphasized with the size of the circles. But also importantly, uh, well, technically, this is a decision about the accession of one country uh, into the other. So what has Lear to do with that? But the, in, in the bold, in the center of the, of the ballot, uh, you have here the name of the leader, meaning that it's actually the acclamation for the leader and not simply a constitutional decision. So if we look at those two instances, uh, we can see uh, two common preconditions uh, that helped uh, the establishment of this kind of uh, regime in both uh, France and Germany. One of them is the um, sudden introduction of universal franchise. That happened uh, radically in France in, 40, uh, in 1848, where 
before that, under the July monarchy, only a small minority of uh, the people was entitled to vote. And then in, in 1848, you have immediately the universal male suffrage. And French were quite happy about that. They celebrated this um, uh, holiday, uh, this feast of, uh, of equality. And then it suddenly turned out that uh, those uh, men, uh, suddenly given the, this right to vote, they were looking for, uh, basically for an emperor to vote for. And when they uh, were given this opportunity, well, they voted for Napoleon. It was a different Napoleon, but it didn't matter. Uh, and then uh, actually Republicans briefly tried to uh, suppress the, the voter rights, uh, but uh, in 1850 and 1851, Napoleon III was smart enough already to well, he wasn't Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, of course, back then. So he was smart, smart enough to resist them and to restore the universal uh, suffrage, which would help him, of course, in those plebiscites. The same thing happened in Germany in 1919, uh, only with, with, with the women, uh, because uh, in Germany in 1919, also quite suddenly the, uh, the empire collapsed and uh, the Republic uh, assumed that all the citizens, uh, <clears throat> females included, uh, now have the voting, uh, the voting rights. So it's important to see how this radical extension of franchise uh, favors the establishment of this kind of uh, monarchical power relying on, um, on popular legitimacy. Uh, this is why actually this plebiscitarian design is a feature of uh, the present day uh, democracies. It is, uh, it is closely connected with the idea of uh, universal universal suffrage. Uh, couldn't happen before that. And then the second important precondition is the resentment after historical defeat. Obviously, the French were um, quite resented about uh, the loss in the Napoleonic Wars. And um, 30 years after that, they were still longing for a, a major revenge. With the Germans, I think it's pretty obvious that uh, with this uh, theory of uh, uh, knife, uh, knife stub in the back, uh, this is how many Germans perceived their loss in the World War One, uh, meaning that actually it was a treason, a betrayal of Germany, and of course the the Treaty of Versailles was humiliating for the Germans. So there was a lot of resentment after this historical defeat that would lead to uh, Paul von Hindenburg, uh, the, the general, the field general becoming the president. And then of course, uh, Hitler, who was even more zealous, uh, becoming <clears throat> the, the ruler. Uh, now let's go back to the Russian case, uh, where we have, of course, both of those preconditions uh, fulfilled. First, uh, in the 1990s, uh, we had this sudden introduction of real election. Well, there was, um, to a certain extent, there, was, there were the elections under the Soviet Union, but nobody treated them seriously, of course, because uh, it was a, a very different procedure. Uh, you were, normally, you would face only one candidate uh, on the ballot, uh, and uh, those who would uh, take the ballot and go to, to a booth uh, to make a mark were already uh, reported to the authorities because uh, the rules were that if you are vote for the candidate, you leave no marks. So you are supposed to take the ballot and immediately uh, get it to, um, to the box. So if you uh, take the pen, it already means that you are not reliable. And that was really, really dangerous to, to do this sort of thing. So it was not real election, of course. And then suddenly in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, the uh, Russians uh, get this, uh, well, this, this chance at uh, real, uh, real uh, voting right. The side in the real voting right. And then, of course, you have uh, the second precondition you have uh, the, um, the defeat, which was the defeat of the Cold War. Now I'd like to emphasize that, uh, of course, uh, this defeat was not felt so bitterly in the 90s. So to a very significant extent, it was aggrandized uh, and turned into, uh, into a 
true neurosis uh, by Putin's administration in the notice. But still, it was a sort of defeat. Um, while well, it could be perceived in a different way as a, as a next step of uh, evolution, and this is what the liberals tried to do, but uh, the idea that uh, Soviet Union lost the Cold War, was defeated, uh, was still present uh, among parts of the population. So you have to the two preconditions uh, here, a country which uh, suffers some major historical loss, introduces the universal suffrage, and now <clears throat> waiting for a plebiscitarian leader to come. Uh, the part of, uh, part of the setup was already the super presidential constitution that emerged in 1993 after the brief conflict between President Yeltsin and the parliament. It resulted in the new Russian constitution, which is super presidential. Uh, so it already gives a lot of power to the president and it uh, actually even eliminated the vice president uh, position because vice president uh, Rutskoy back then was of course um, part of the coalition against the, uh, the president. So uh, in this design, we have a strong leader with extraordinary powers towering over the political uh, system and relying on democratic legitimacy. This is what we have in Russia, and it, this, was, uh, this, this was made even more prominent uh, in the 2020 after this constitutional referendum that I mentioned uh, earlier, which basically turned Russia into, into an electoral monarchy. Because right now, at this point, with this constitution, there is nothing the president couldn't do. Uh, his power is truly unlimited under this constitution. There's just nothing uh, he was he would not be allowed to do. Um, it is, of course, a combination of monarchy and democracy. Uh, well, the plebiscitarian theorists would call it a plebiscitary democracy, but uh, it would perhaps uh, more sincere to call it a plebiscitary monarchy. Uh, it doesn't make much difference. So now Russia is this combination of monarchy with Putin being an emperor uh, and democratic legitimacy. Uh, importantly, of course, electoral events are widely perceived as acclamations, uh, so that uh, the decisions made by the president are perceived as uh, unchangeable. Uh, one cannot influence those decisions. They, uh, well, they basically uh, are uh, made uh, by uh, well, in a, in a theological way, you could uh, say that they are made by God, that they come down from, the, from God. And uh, since they are God-made decisions, you are not supposed to, to challenge them, to protest against them, but you are, you are supposed to contribute to them coming true, contribute to them uh, having effect, contribute to them uh, becoming really fruitful. Uh, and uh, in order for that to happen, uh, acclamations are required. The people now is, of course, passive. Uh, one truth that is uh, often hidden is that actually the level of participation in both elections and opinion polls is quite low. As for the opinion polls, uh, those uh, response rates are almost never reported. But from our experiments, we know that there's somewhere between 7 to 15 percent, or maybe 20 percent, depends on method, from the initial sample frame. Uh, so basically, we know something about the 7 to 20 percent. We know nothing about the, the rest because these people cannot be accessed. They are either cannot be reached or they refuse to, to talk. Uh, and that is important because uh, this is the, the prevailing pattern of behavior for, for the Russians to abstain uh, from participating in politics in any meaningful way. There's a lot of disengagement, of course, a lot of disenchantment about both uh, elections and polls. Now, there are some exceptions about these participation rates. We can talk about uh, that recently, uh, the president who required the, the absolute majority uh, of support was pressing uh, the people to turn out at the, at the polling stations, was happened during the 2018 elections, but also during this 2020 uh, constitutional plebiscite. There, the participation rate was higher 
And still, uh, he only managed to get uh, with um, to get about uh, 15 percent, uh, sorry, 50 percent of support uh, for his um, for his personal rule uh, from from the whole population. And part of that is, of course, uh, voter fraud. So generally, the participation uh, rates are very low. Uh, having said that, I would just remind you that uh, we know from political theory that those passive and atomized isolated masses actually are quite, can be quite dangerous because it is from these masses that the historical fascist regimes uh, were building their strong support. So I think we are now in a very, very precarious situation in Russia, precisely because of this uh, popular passivity. Uh, now, uh, well, um, one uh, example of showing the uh, uh, the way, showing, showing how it works, was with uh, the special military operations, what's also called this way in, in Syria. Uh, back when uh, Putin decided to intervene in, in, in the Syrian civil war. Uh, so back then, just a week before the, um, it was announced, there was uh, an opinion poll uh, where uh, the majority of respondents uh, were uh, saying that they're against uh, any kind of intervention into, uh, into, this, into this civil war in Syria. But then the decision would be announced that actually Russia takes part uh, in, in this crisis. And then a different poll was conducted just uh, in a week without, I would say, much justification coming from, from the above. Uh, and it would immediately reverse the numbers. Um, the same thing applies actually to the situation in Ukraine, <clears throat> because obviously we had no, uh, no public demonstrations on the streets. Uh, calling for uh, the uh, the military operation, calling for the army uh, invading uh, Ukraine or solving the the Donbas question, um, it was uh, the, uh, perceived as a ready-made decision. And for that reason, uh, I uh, well, if if we imagine that on February 24th, Putin had for some security reasons decided to hand over those uh, parts of Luhansk and Donetsk regions back to Ukraine, the, uh, the support could be expected to be exactly the same. Probably the composition would change a little bit, but uh, the numbers of support would be exactly the same. Uh, now this uh, low turnout, it contributes uh, to producing popular legitimacy uh, with uh, alleged super majorities. And what you see here is actually the, uh, the typical <clears throat> math of Russian election. You have a 20% turnout, 15% of them are people who are dependent, uh, highly dependent on the state, yet they're basically bust or forced to go to the polling stations. And under those conditions, the incumbent gets 75%, which creates, of course, uh, the, <clears throat> the impression of the overwhelming majority. <clears throat> and since this, this is an atomized uh, country with isolated individuals, people would, uh, seldom communicate with each other, particularly about politics, and they would take this for granted. Um, uh, I would probably make a brief comment against what is called in political science, the falsified preferences theory, uh, which implies that in authoritarian uh, settings, people falsify the preferences, meaning that actually they are against Putin, but they would tell the pollsters or, uh, voted the election uh, they, uh, for Putin because they are afraid of repression. I think the theory is uh, wrong precisely because it assumes that uh, people have their fixed preferences, which is not the case, not the case in a depoliticized uh, situation. Because depoliticized, depoliticized people uh, are not likely to develop stable preferences. So people generally try to stay away from politics and the claim to any decision made by the leader. Well, let me finish that with uh, some, uh, some observations on the traje trajectory of those regimes and also some predictions uh, coming from that. Uh, one uh, common feature of those regimes is that they tend to repress domestic politics. 
uh, because the leader is supposed to represent the whole people, not part of the people. Uh, and for that reason, uh, the domestic opposition is uh, considered to be, well, basically legitimate. Um, the opposition can only exist to the extent that it uh, supports the leader, could disagree with some of his decisions, but supports the leader. Because uh, if there is a challenge uh, about, about the person of the leader, he already destroys the popular unity uh, and um, deprives the leader of the right to represent the whole people. So this uh, constant repression of domestic politics leads to, overestimate, uh, to overestimating the danger from abroad because there's elements of opposition which inevitably emerge in each and every society just the, the human nature. So they are perceived as a projection of uh, external threats. It is not that uh, there is a different part of society which uh, considers the public good to be different from the ruler, but the enemy, the external enemy, uh, paying these people or plotting against the ruler, uh, trying to uh, subvert the, the state uh, through this injection of opposition into society. This is why all domestic opposition is immediately perceived as a projection of, uh, of the animosity uh, from the outside. And that in turn uh, leads to overestimating the real dangers coming from abroad, which uh, results in military adventurism, which results in all those regimes starting um, paradoxical wars, because none of them was really endangered uh, from the outside at the point when they started those, uh, those wars, but they were perceiving the situation as existential threat. Uh, and that was also the case with Russia, where uh, for the last five years, uh, we were observing growing domestic fatigue with Putin, uh, even among those who are generally grateful to him for the higher life standards, stand why, why should we always have this, uh, this man uh, on the top of the state? So there's a grow domestic fatigue, but also very importantly, generational cleavages. Because for the younger generation, particularly for those who, were, uh, who grew up uh, under Putin, uh, this fatigue is really strong. And they are much less likely to, uh, to be enthusiastic about him, but they are also much uh, deeper uh, embedded uh, into global communication flows uh, and therefore perceive Russia uh, to be part of, of, the, global, of the global community. Um, so that kind of created uh, for a situation of almost inevitable upcoming uh, uprising uh, in Russia, similar to what we saw in Belarus in, in 2020. Uh, I would say that even uh, in terms of its composition, uh, it could be assumed to, to be very, very similar to what we saw in, in Belarus, coming from the, the same uh, parts of society and having a very good chance at establishing a hegemony uh, in, in, in society. Uh, and to that, Putin's administration reacted with this undifferentiated perception of internal and external challenges, meaning that this challenge from, in, from the inside was perceived as a continuation of the challenge from the outside, uh, with Ukraine being the stronghold of the, the opponent uh, who is trying to uh, secure Ukraine as a, sovereign, uh, as a sovereign state from where the political challenge to Putin's rule uh, might come. And this is why Putin coined this term anti-Russia, meaning, of course, anti-Putin, uh, meaning that uh, Ukraine becomes the source of existential threat to, to himself. And that actually explains the invasion, because many people were um, puzzled about the fact that Putin is willing to take uh, those additional risks in this situation. But the thing is that for him, the risk of inaction is too high, is actually existential. Uh, assuming that there would be an inevitable uprising very soon, uh, inaction, uh, failure to, uh, uh, to subvert the international order, starting with Ukraine, would actually be um, a, fatal, uh, a fatal mistake. And that's why he started uh, this war until it was uh, too late. Now, my final conclusion. Uh, 
would be that uh, in all those previous cases, we saw that, that eventually after a military defeat, a major military defeat, those empires, uh, those plebiscitarian empires uh, were transformed into republics in a very painful way, but still the idea of Republican life prevailed. I very much hope that this is going to happen uh, in Russia too. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a very, very um, difficult, uh, bloody uh, and um, problematic experience for, uh, for Russia. But now with those younger generations um, understanding the Republican life much better uh, and uh, with this uh, empire basically having nothing to offer to its neighbors, I think the Republican path is still possible for Russia after that ends. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Uh, great perspective. Um, uh, we have uh, some raised hands and I have to um, repeat once again. So if you have any questions or comment, please use the Q&A box uh, and send your questions in English over there. Uh, otherwise, even if you raise your hand, we will take it as an acclamation for Greg's presentation, but not more than that. Uh, so the next step is uh, um, we will ask Professor Matsuzato to give his uh, comments uh, to the speech. Those on the rest uh, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first, uh, I would like to correct uh, the kind introduction by the Chairman. I'm not a Russian specialist. I'm a Ukrainian specialist. And I might be the specialist in the Russian Empire, but, but not the Russian Federation. So today's uh, dialogue will be very interesting because uh, Dr. Yudin introduced himself not as Russia specialist, I, I, neither am I. And thank you, uh, Dr. Yudin, for your uh, very uh, timely and insightful paper. A point I found very interesting is that, uh, as Dr. Yudin notes, empires born from uh, previous, uh, previous, previous uh, democracies tend to overact, over, overreact to imagine the foreign threat and the pave way to their own collapse. This mechanism explains why Putin started the reckless war, genuine, genuinely believing that Russia was in an existential threat exactly when Russia outlived the difficult years of cheap oil since 2014 and when it had become possible for Putin to revitalize his beloved patrona politics with abundant subsidies. I want to address a question to Dr. Eugene. So I, if I did ask something to Dr. Eugene, uh, do Russians indeed support whatever the authorities propose? Uh, is it not necessary for the Russian authorities to endeavor to increase public support uh, it was obvious that the intervention in the Syrian war would be a very unpopular decision. So the Putin government prepared a maximally painless strategy to concentrate on air strikes by creating the Air Cosmos Force uh, while uh, assi uh, assigning painful land battles to Syrian soldiers. Explanations by Putin's representatives at the Federal Council to gain its confirmation of military intervention was much more detailed and careful than the Crimean case taking place one and a half year, year before. I do not think that the constitutional referendum in 2020 could have been so successful if COVID-19 had not theorized Putin for his decisive anti-COVID action. In early March 2022, the support for Russia's invasion in Ukraine was 58%, while 23 responded negatively. In June, I suppose some 80% of respondents uh, supported the invasion. Without tremendous endeavor, this change could not have been made. A basic way to make citizens support the, aggress uh, make citizens support the aggressive war is to convince them that Russia was in existential crisis on the eve of the war. Therefore, in March, uh, Russian mass media uh, disclosed the fact that Ukraine had planned to attack not only DPR LPR, but also on Voronezh and Rostov Oblast, passing the DPR territory, and on Crimea as well. But this news 
seemed too stupid to be re repeated and to convincing the people. So this propaganda was ceased quickly, but a more future-oriented propaganda started. Mass media intensified acclaim for the Soviet Union for its geopolitical position and economic uh, self-sufficiency, of course, not for socialism. Mass media uh, described Russia's import substitution with a much more positive uh, light as a way leading Russia to a self-sufficiency. The Bologna process in higher education was rejected because it devastated Russian student and technical specialist knowledge. David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage was the leading ideology for the RSSR succession from the USSR. But Ricardo was rejected eventually. And this rejection lifted restriction on Russia's territorial expansion. From 1990 to 2021, both Russian communists and elites believed uh, that natural resource, not territory, was making them rich. Russians believed uh, territorial expansion to regions without natural resources, such as Ukraine, would make them poor. Now they do not think so. On June 29th, the St. Petersburg government organized a grandiose graduation ceremony. This ceremony provided a spectacle, symboli spectacle symbolizing a new Russia. A sailing ship passed through draw bridges, uh, shined by salutes. Graduates from Peter's sister city, Mariupoli, were invited to the event and responded TV interviews. If Russian citizens began to request it, began to be requested to change their lifestyle, rejecting authoritarian meism and consumerism, perhaps it is not uh, for the military contribution but rather for this pursued Soviet development. But I'm not sure whether the authorities request Russian citizens to change their lifestyle. It is unsurprising that Shetishati Minut or Baisha Ura are playing their role much more intensively than peacetime. What terrifies me is that a majority of Russian TV programs continue to be assigned to comedies, detectives, and popular music uh, when the nation are causing sufferings and sacrifices to the, to the neighbors. Thanks to the uh, tangible gap of military potentials between the two countries, Russia has not been in need of general mobilization. Taking the contemporary military technology for granted, it seems useless uh, to mobilize youth unable to, share helicopter, uh, unable to steer helicopters or to shell by hoisters. In, con in contemporary wars, even infantry should be well-trained soldiers. If Russia needs general mobilization, it will be a serious challenge for Putin's regime, but it seems unlikely that this might happen. Lastly, I'd like to honestly support Dr. Eugene's prescription that Russians should stop fetishizing elections and referendums, but pay more attention to the, the qualities of democracy. Yet electoral, electoral fetishism in Russia and other post-Soviet countries have very deep Soviet roots. So the way to overcome it will be long and winding. Uh, thank you for attention. Uh, Professor Matsuzura, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, we are uh, receiving a couple of questions uh, in Q&A. Please uh, keep on posting. Uh, and uh, uh, before we start answering, uh, Greg will have a few minutes to react to Professor Matsuzata's uh, comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Matsuzato. Thank you for uh, taking your time. Uh, to uh, to read the the paper uh, and to uh, develop this uh, this useful uh, comment, I'll probably uh, react to several points uh, you made. Well, the the general question you asked was: Is it necessary for the authorities to to do something to increase uh, public support? Uh, well, of course, uh, it doesn't just happen spontaneously. Um, but uh, the most important point here is that um, those opinion polls uh, are uh, sort of integrated uh, into the whole machinery of uh, developing the support. So how would that happen normally? Uh, 
uh, the uh, the pollsters who are controlled by by the Kremlin would be tasked to uh, conduct an uh, uh, an opinion poll among the population on some uh, possible measure to be taken by the Kremlin. Uh, now let's imagine that uh, the result is not very favorable. That would not be released, would be kept secret. Uh, and uh, then the uh, propaganda would start uh, preparing the public opinion for, uh, for the decision. After that, the second poll would be taken. It would normally uh, uh, display uh, a little bit better situation. And it, it means that you have to uh, turn propaganda on uh, on a different level. And then at the third time, probably you would uh, end up with, uh, with uh, an acceptable situation. This is something you would release finally. And that would become part of the propaganda itself, uh, communicating to the people the message that, well, now the people is behind the, uh, behind the decision. So what is missing here is, of course, the discussion of whether this, the decision is necessary. It just has no place in this system because no one was disclosing that is, the decision is, is going to be to be made, and that's why, of course, the decision is uh, perceived as inevitable, as ready-made by by the population. So the polls themselves are part of this uh, of this system. Uh, now, um, well, I think you made a, a couple of good examples that actually show how uh, how this works. Uh, I wouldn't. I would probably dispute that uh, Putin was successful uh, in treating COVID nineteen, as opposed to many uh, world leaders. His uh, ratings actually didn't go up during the uh, the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, and well, basically the strategy of the Russian government was inaction. And now we know why, because they need uh, to save they needed to save money for the war, so they couldn't distribute money. Uh, and actually, there was a lot of discontent. So I wouldn't say uh, he was credited for uh, for saving the country back then, uh, but rather the whole idea of uh, of this constitutional reform was announced as a ready as ready made, and therefore we clearly saw how people who opposed this reform, mainly the, uh, the younger people, abstained from showing up. Whereas the people who supported the reform, uh, they uh, went to the polling stations uh, in massive numbers, or rather were forced to, uh, to do so. Um, now, just uh, um, a final comment on, um, on the prospects. I actually agree with you that uh, the general mobilization would be a serious challenge for, uh, for Putin. Uh, and this is why he's not doing that. And this is why what we're seeing now, the, um, the structure of the Russian army is carefully uh, picked from those regions where people are either completely defenseless, they cannot protest, or where you have uh, some sort of uh, like um, broad, uh, broadly conceived uh, support for this military operation. In Moscow, we have no no doubt. In St. Petersburg, they have no doubt. So no no corpses, nothing comes comes back from there, and people are well mainly in a, in a position to ignore what's going on there. But having said that, I would say that uh, I wouldn't still underestimate the chance of general mobilization. It would definitely require a preparation, a, pre a preliminary preparation of the public opinion, reframing the whole situation as the great patriotic war as an existential struggle for the country. So now I come back to my previous uh, comment that uh, this, you know, these passive masses, they're actually very, very dangerous because they can easily be uh, brought together under a fascist design where this, but people just start acting out of fear, out of being scared. And that I think would probably uh, be a chance to get a general mobilization. At this point, I still regard this as dubious because the youngsters are much less, much more skeptical about this war. But in the coming years, well, let's see what happens now with this new education uh, reform, uh, which definitely will put more propaganda, uh, more emphasis on propaganda. I don't know, honestly, I don't know. I think the situation is very, very dangerous in that respect. And, and this general mobilization, the reframing of the 
of the war as an existential struggle for the Russians is the thing that uh, everyone should uh, should fear uh, should fear most. Thank you, Professor Matsudata. Thank you, Greg, for your reactions. Uh, we are receiving a couple of questions, uh, so I will read uh, in the order of uh, they were being received. Uh, speaking about the e-votes e in Russia, uh, you have mentioned that uh, now we can say that this country is one of the most developed in that sense. So, but uh, is it possible to say that those voting system and applications are recognized internationally? Uh, is there uh, audit trial, uh, the, the process of recording all changes in, in data throughout the life of circular data component incorporating the Russian e-vote system? Uh, what is your take on it? Well, there was a lot of criticism about the system implemented uh, in, in Russia. It was uh, most obvious uh, last September when it was implemented during the parliamentary elections uh, in Moscow. So in Moscow, I guess we had something like 15 or 16 uh, electoral districts. And in most of them, the candidates from the opposition uh, won uh, on the real uh, polling stations. Uh, and then the results of the voting were disclosed, which turned out to be uh, the reverse. Uh, and they reversed the, uh, um, the results in all those districts. Uh, implying that somehow there are uh, two types of Russian, uh, two types of Moscovites. The real Moscovites vote for the opposition, while the virtual Moscovites they somehow support the uh, the ruling party. And that was, of course, attributed to a fraud, which I'm completely sure it was uh, was enough uh, evidence. And part of the issue, of course, is that uh, the control over the of the system was basically not available for the for the opposition so it was not impartial it was not uh, was not not no independent uh, oversight uh, here but that doesn't change my general argument uh, and the general argument is that the, this voting enthusiasm this electoral enthusiasm actually gains traction in russia so even among the people who are kind of concerned about the, the safety uh, of the system, there's a lot of support for like moving online generally for, for having those uh, electronic uh, voting systems. Uh, to, uh, to me as a democratic theorist, as a theorist of democracy, the whole idea is completely wrong. Uh, it is not the, the implementation, but the whole idea, which is completely wrong, precisely because it, re because it reduces uh, democracy to this, you know, snapshot thing, uh, meaning that the, the task of democracy is to register the pre-existing uh, preferences among the people, whereas the democracy is actually the communication, uh, the, the campaigning, uh, the debate, the discussion, uh, sometimes a strife. So basically, the collective undertaking in in, in developing uh, the the common path, rather than uh, simply a uh, snapshot of the popular will. So that's why I think the problem is with the the whole plebiscitary imagination, rather than with the implementation of the system, which of course you are right is very very problematic in Russia. Thank you very much. We are proceeding to the next question. Uh, thank you deeply for insightful presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the one, uh, the first one concerns so-called division uh, for the Russian society between educated elites and the mass. Uh, do you think the features you pointed out, passivity, fluidity, and so on, uh, only apply to the mass, while the elites are excluded from the plebiscitary monarchy you described? Uh, the second question concerns the hope of uh, transformation of Russia from empire to republic. I uh, do you think this transformation is accompanied by a territorial dissolution of the Russian Federation, which seems to be an asset to free Russians from imperial consciousness. That's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, to the first question, no, of course, the, the elites are themselves part, part of this plebiscitary design. They have the same mentality. Well, uh, actually, the way it works is that the, the president, who has those uh, manufactured numbers of popular support, he comes to the elites and says, look, uh, I am uh, the, the big guy, the big man, because I have this, uh, these people behind me. And he uses this stick of the people to threaten the elites. Uh, I can do whatever I want to, to do to you because there's a people behind me. Uh, and then, I mean, nobody really cares that these people is fictional, that people is, is manufactured, but he 
uh, threatens them with this stick. And that's why they are also very much isolated. There is no coordination among the elites. This is very important because, I mean, uh, now we have a lot of talk about like uh, possible coup. But in order to have a coup, you basically need, first of all, you need to start like talking to each other. And uh, the elites are terribly scared about just talking to each other because that already means, uh, I mean, everyone, everyone is concerned about being uh, followed, spied on, uh, and uh, that already means some sort of, uh, you know, being non, not, not reliable. Uh, so this uh, is a general uh, view, I think, that unites both the elites, the mass, and actually the president himself. Because he himself is, of course, also very, very isolated, uh, as you can see with those ridiculous uh, tables. Um, now, the second question, that's a good question. Um, well, what I'm talking about is, of course, a political transformation, uh, a transformation of political principle, because now Russia is uh, incredibly hierarchical. I know there are ideas of Russia being always like that, always having those uh, authoritarian tendencies, but one has to understand that this level of concentration of power uh, on the top is almost unprecedented in Russia. Probably we had something like that with Stalin over several years, probably something like with Peter the Great, not even sure about Ivan the Terrible, it was more, uh, more complicated. Uh, I mean, most Russian Tsars, uh, not speaking, of course, about the general secretaries of the Communist Party, had, had nothing like that, uh, not nearly. Uh, and the whole system is hierarchical because you have those little Putins everywhere. So the, the, the way to get things done is to find someone who knows someone who has the connections to someone who can uh, pass the word to, to, to the boss. And this is how the things are running in, in Russia. Whereas the Republican way of doing things would be, of course, much more political equality, collective action, the horizontal uh, relationship, uh, and much smaller distance um, to, uh, to, to power and to authority. This is the transformation that is necessary. Is it necessary to, um, for, for a territorial dissolution to happen? Honestly, I'm not sure about that uh, from the political viewpoint. But at the same time, I hold it for be very likely. Because with uh, this invasion, a uh, very bad thing happened. Uh, we failed to stick to the borders of Russian Federation established in 1991. The Russian Federation no longer knows where its borders are. What actually, I mean, like even leaving Donbass aside, what the hell is Russian Federation doing in Kherson? Like, what would be the claim on Kherson from the part of Russian Federation? And that destroys the, the idea of Russian Federation as a, as a state which has its fixed borders. But if you can move borders forward, they can easily be made moved backward because as uh, Russian president himself believes that there's no, no major difference between Belgrade and Kharkiv. But if you can shell Kharkiv, obviously Belgrade can, can be shelled as well. So I, I think it is very likely that uh, Russia will not uh, remain in its uh, pre-2022 uh, borders. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, the next question, I, I still see some um, hands raised. Uh, please uh, put down your questions into Q&A box and we will definitely uh, try to read it out. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what will be the signs of upcoming Russian uprise? Uh, and as for now, it is hard to detect any. I mean, I agree with that. Uh, I, I would differentiate here between the potential for the uprising uh, and the, uh, like the actual signs. Well, the potential is there. Uh, well, the potential is there and uh, we could see it in 2021 when remember we had a record breaking uh, mass uh, demonstrations throughout the country uh, after Alexei Navalny decided to return to, to Russia. Uh, and there was not only a record break in terms of numbers, but also in terms of geography, uh, which was, of course, a big, uh, big surprise. Um, well, back then, let's be honest, the chance of uh, delivering a change was really slim, and it still made people uh, get out on the streets. 
So now with this uh, situation, of course, uh, it is much more drastic for, uh, for a huge part of Russian population, which feels uh, really, really, um, I mean, existentially assaulted with this, uh, with this war, particularly people who are part of, of the global community. Well, they're now being told that they are, will be cut forever from, uh, from the global community. So the, the potential for the uprising is there. The issue is that we can expect a collective political action when there is a sort of you know, path to, uh, to the success. When people can see that their participation even if they are ready to take risks, uh, would uh, have a chance, like a real chance uh, to result in a, in a change. And this is now, of course, absent. So now I think uh, we should be looking for some sign of some, some sort of openings or cracks in the system, which would create uh, uh, an opportunity for, uh, for the people to see how their contribution to a collective movement would uh, actually uh, deliver. The uprising cannot be motivated solely by, by the despair. But if the sign, the, the, those, those cracks are there, uh, I think the potential is pretty high. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have a, a revolution in, in Russia um, pretty soon. I wouldn't be surprised if we haven't, but I wouldn't be surprised if we do. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next question is um, coming from Japan. When did electoral uh, uh, events begin to be perceived as acclamations in Russia? Uh, did it completely uh, coincide with the arrival of Putin or did Yeltsin have anything to do with this process? Very good question. Um, well, I, um, I recall there was an anecdote uh, um, among the Russian political technologists uh, in the 1990s. Uh, it, was, it was an actual uh, old lady who uh, voted in 1996 election where um, Yeltsin uh, was competing against uh, Gennady Zuganov. Uh, so a, a correspondent uh, asked her who did, he, did she vote for? She, asked, she said Yeltsin. Uh, and when he asked, and why not Zuganov? She answered, well, when Zuganov is president, we will vote for Zuganov, uh, which is precisely the, of course, the, the acclamation mentality. So it shows that it was present back then, but uh, Yeltsin himself um, did not really uh, see his uh, power relying on that sort of uh, authority. Yeltsin was, of course, very um, ambiguous, a contradictory leader, but he had this, those democratic uh, elements uh, in his thinking and uh, in, his, in his policies. He established this super presidential constitution, which was, of course, a major contribution to the, uh, to the later uh, rise of libertarianism, but he himself uh, didn't really need this sort of uh, acclamation. So I would say that Yeltsin's role was to uh, you know, to put in action this this system, which was waiting for uh, for a, uh, a conscious, a self conscious plebiscitarian to to come in, and this is when there was this major turn, not only among uh, some layers of people, like with this old lady, but also with the majority of population starting to perceive uh, the the election as as acclamation. So, so it still seems to me that the major things happened already under Putin. Thank you. Yeah, well, this example actually reminds me of one Soviet anecdote uh, when Rabinovich mentioned that he was Kalibalsa, Mestis Linea Party. So, like the way with their party line, uh, so we can speak about acclamation uh, and uh, in heritage well, from, from the Soviet past. No, that, that, that's actually a very interesting question. I think uh, Professor Masuzata also made this comment that part of that might come actually from the Soviet past. Even though I made the, the claim that uh, Soviet elections were not real elections and everybody was aware of that. But still, you know, this mechanism of communication, I mean, as a sort of cultural pattern, it might have something to do. My take on that would be still that uh, the, 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 important, the most important things happened when uh, this idea of democracy came over, was important from the West uh, and democracy was identified with the elections. And the whole idea was that, well, what democracy is it when we, when we go voting? This is how it started degrading. But to some extent, I think uh, you both are right that uh, the Soviet past might uh, have something to do. And that's why I think we actually, 
the 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 Soviet elections they deserve actually uh, a study uh, because we have a very very limited uh, evidence, very very limited uh, number of studies uh, about the Soviet uh, elections. They are normally treated as insignificant. Well, not sure about that. Okay, next question. Um, I think a professor Yudin is going to listen to your presentation. As a Russian who is against the war and is fearful to fly back to Russia, do you think? Uh, is now power to do in uh, what do you think is now power to do in this situation? What would you recommend as action steps to uh, make it in order to contribute to Russia to be hating for the good and not into the dark? Thank you. Um, well, it depends on how you see um, the future of, of our country. Uh, to me, at least, it is absolutely clear that uh, Russia has no. Um, no future uh, if it uh, continues with this uh, imperial stubbornness. Not just because empire is bad, but because Russia is a weak empire. It's a decaying empire. It has no, no claim for hegemony. Uh, it is not attractive to its uh, neighbors. And this is why they are uh, trying to flee away from, uh, from Russia. Uh, so if we agree that uh, there is no, um, no imperial future for Russia, uh, then Russia should be repositioned completely as part of uh, the global community. And I think uh, we all need now, painful as it is now, uh, difficult as it is now, but we all need now to start rethinking what Russia should be um, in, the, in the close future. And that would in turn, um, you know, uh, influence uh, the behavior of the people also in, uh, in Russia right now. Because now um, the, um, the, um, the dark element of this is that for many people, uh, this decision to, to start this invasion and to cut Russia off from, from the global community is perceived as a, as a, as a fate. Uh, and uh, while they obviously see no other options. So these options should be provided. These options should be given, particularly to the elites, which, um, I mean, I know that from them, you can imagine that, but I know that from them personally, of course, we are quite quite unhappy about this decision and they were never consulted about that. But uh, once they see the opportunity for a different future uh, without uh, this government that takes the whole country uh, down, that would be uh, a path forward. So to me now, uh, the, uh, the task uh, is to develop very, very clear prospects for uh, Russia to recover after that. Uh, there is no doubt to me that this war will be lost by, uh, by Russia. So we have to uh, make it very clear that uh, there is an alternative path for our country and it should be, uh, it should be developed. So uh, to, uh, to wrap it up, uh, to make uh, Russia part of the global community again, to work for international solidarity uh, against, uh, yeah, against this uh, this type of uh, this type of uh, rule, which, as we see, uh, not only has um, hegemony in, in in Russia, but also infects in a very significant way um, the elites uh, the elites abroad. So building international movement, making part, Russia part of international movement, developing an international future for Russia is something that we can uh, do uh, right now for our country. Thank you. Next question. Uh, according to many sources, there are more people supporting SMI. I, I, I believe it refers to special military operation in May and June than in early March. I do believe they're reliable, these sources, and uh, if so, what are the reasons for the raise of this support? Uh, oh, that actually has something to do with, uh, uh, with the, the way the, the opinion polls are interpreted. Because look, um, in a normal situation, uh, if you are approached uh, by, by a, uh, an interviewer, 
well, you at least you you are, you understand that uh, you are supposed to uh, to acclaim because and that that's actually important. It's something I forgot to to mention. It comes from our own research that uh, the vast majority of Russians perceive the opinion polls to be conducted by the state, even when this is not the case. Even even when the independent pollsters are uh, conducting the uh, the research, Russians mm, don't know the difference, and they are uh, interpreted as as being approached by the state, act, asked by the state to uh, to tell the opinion. And many interviewers, I mean, I myself, of course, was a field interviewer um, many times. Many interviewers in the in this country uh, had an experience of hearing from their respondents, well. Please tell to Putin uh, that something, meaning that they are perceived to be the communicators between the respondent and, and the, the emperor, which of course is not the case, but who cares? Uh, so uh, during normal times, at least uh, you can uh, allow yourself uh, either to uh, abstain or maybe some, sometimes even to, to show the, uh, the discontent. In the wartime, when you're approached by a pollster, uh, well, the, uh, the demand of acclamation is really strong. So if you're really not supporting the war, you are very unlikely to have something to do with those people. Once again, they are delegates from the state. Everybody knows that the state is watching uh, what's going on. Technically, only technically, but still, uh, if you uh, oppose the special military operation, it can be uh, punished with 15 years in prison. That's not going to happen with the normal respondent, of course, but everyone is aware of the situation. So the situation is very tense, and I uh, already heard the reports of people who were um, responding to those calls on the streets, uh, being immediately attacked uh, by, uh, by the proponents of, uh, of, of this war. So in this very conflicted uh, situation where the state is obviously not on your side, uh, where it demands an acclamation from you, I mean, resisting this acclamation is very difficult. So to me, at least, uh, it is completely logical. I, I would probably add one more thing here just to make you understand how it works. Um, not only Putin's ratings went, went up uh, after the special military operations started, but the ratings of all uh, officials all officials, including prime minister, including all the major politicians. So the people understand that they are uh, demanded to say yes, and they say yes. The most interesting thing happened, of course, with Vladimir Zhirinovsky, whose ratings uh, were going up and up uh, in February and March, and then probably in April, uh, even though it is not, not published. The problem with Zhirinovsky, of course, is that he was uh, dead by then. But still, his ratings were going up. Uh, which uh, shows convincingly, I think, how people um, perceive this demand for, uh, for acclamation. So to me, it, it, is, it is completely predictable. Thank you. The next one, uh, the impressive mass which claims the given decision from the above during the um, electoral events. Uh, how in this situation one can assume that this mass who well used to think that everything is predetermined would suddenly turn against the incumbent. Well, that's uh, what normally happens in these situations. Uh, you know, um, this element of, uh, of surprise is uh, um, embedded in them precisely because, um, because of that, uh, you know, mass composition. Uh, when it is not the mass, when it is something internally structured, you can more easily predict how it behaves. When it is a mass which is unstructured, well, you can repress it all the time, but then it suddenly uh, emerges in a quite unexpected situation. This is the dynamic uh, of uh, many revolutions uh, in, the, in the authoritarian countries, uh, including uh, those over the last couple of decades. So whenever uh, a change uh, comes in, in, inside this country, that would be uh, sudden and uh, immediate and not something long prepared. Uh, no, nothing like that. Uh, so uh, internally, like in, in terms of experience, when people suddenly realize that they have an opportunity, that there is an opening, some, suddenly something very different uh, 
emerges and rises in, inside them. Just because this is a political nature of, of humans, we always look for an opportunity for a political action. Sometimes it is quite repressed as it happens in, in Russia now, but the, the strife for this political action never uh, disappears. And once there is this, uh, this opening, people immediately uh, run, uh, run over. So um, the, the scenario is likely to be uh, quite, quite unexpected in, uh, in any way. Uh, if you ask me what would be the driver, once again, I mentioned it, it should be a, some sort of crack in the system. It could be a military defeat. Um, next question. I, I still see some uh, raised hands. Please use a chance uh, uh, to put down uh, your comments into the Q&A session. Uh, from the perspective of a uh, person who's asking the question, today's Russian social and political structure is so firm to radical reform. I do think it is possible uh, to have like a kind of a second perestroika by Russian regime after the Putin era. Will uh, there be some chances and motivations for that? Well, precisely because it is so firm, it um, requires a, a radical reform. The thing about that is uh, it is just unable, unable to adapt to, to the realities. This is why it is kind of dragging the whole country back. It is obviously uh, halting its, uh, its development. The very idea of development is now uh, kind of absurd uh, in this system. So it requires a reform. Now, what kind of reform would that be is a different question. Um, if by second perestroika you mean uh, the, the modernist uh, idea of uh, developing a liberal democracy in Russia, well, I, I think it worked badly last time, and um, it is very likely to work badly uh, yet again. Uh, I uh, really uh, think we shouldn't be mesmerized by those uh, ideal cases uh, coming from the West, just importing those institutions uh, and then hoping for uh, delivering the, uh, the common pattern. Uh, this is actually what brought this plebiscitarian uh, system in, in place. Uh, because, you know, uh, when you look at those liberal democratic designs, you see that the elections are crucial for them and say, well, OK, we will have election. This is how we all have liberal democracy. No, this is not the case. If you have elections, you will have a radicalization of liberal democracy, which is plebiscitarian. So to my mind, we definitely need a reform, a huge reform uh, to open up uh, the energy, which is very much uh, there which is now being constantly repressed, particularly coming from, from the younger people. But that shouldn't be a, a reform according to pre existing templates uh, in a, a strange belief that once we implement the institutions that work uh, elsewhere, we will immediately uh, be in, 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 in paradise. Russia has to rethink uh, its uh, place in the global community, and it has to uh, be uh, very conscious about uh, what are the institutions to be imported, what are the institutions to be developed from, uh, from Russia's uh, own history, what are the adaptations uh, needed. But uh, I, I think some sort of reform is actually inevitable. You cannot go on with this, uh, with this system. It just... Mm, blocks any kind of uh, social energy. This is why it's so destructive. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, while we are waiting for one of the last questions, uh, I let myself to ask uh, uh, this kind of question. Uh, many observers uh, in and out of Russia argue that the invasion into Ukraine must be largely explained by the also called uh, inner factors of, of Russian politics itself. I mean, the regime was losing legitimacy, particularly in the perspective, and uh, you also mentioned growing domestic fatigue and so on. Uh, so uh, the threat from outside should uh, serve as a brilliant excuse for all extra measures like further repression and so on. Uh, others argue that there was a security issue, the expansion of NATO and its military cooperation with Ukraine was a real threat for Russia. Obviously, the regime claims that Russia was an existential crisis uh, on the eve of war and Putin is 
uh, uh, this as the main argument for justification of this war. So there are a couple of questions coming from there. Uh, can we see uh, how many Russians actually share the latter view? And uh, what is your own take on it? I mean, um, if we are able to use particular percentage of what kind of reasons were more crucial in uh, the making the decision uh, to start large scale invasion, um, as you correctly mentioned, such as interest Putin tend to overestimate the threat from abroad as well as their own strength. Uh, but can we actually say so they did believe in it or they were uh, uh, thinking more uh, about inner factors? Look, let me challenge the whole premise um, because it kind of relies on the clear distinction between the internal and external factors. But this is precisely the part of this regime that it doesn't make this distinction. Look, uh, over the last two years, um, we've uh, seen people like Nikolai Patrushev uh, being elevated and the whole uh, very clear narrative that uh, Patrushev proposes is that all kind of domestic issues, for instance, the issues with the uh, decrease in legitimacy uh, among the younger population is the um, product of uh, external influence. Uh, so what should be actually, um, what, what the problem is domestically is the external influence. It couldn't be that uh, young Russians are just unhappy with Putin. That, that just can't be imagined. Uh, it should be someone behind them. And those people behind them are of course the Americans. Uh, so the distinction that you are making does not apply here for these people because they see both issues uh, as a part of, uh, of, 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 of the same issue. To them, uh, the, uh, the opposition between countries is a sort of internal, uh, internal struggle, internal war in which uh, instrumentalizing domestic politics is just an element of this, uh, of this war. This is why we are now seeing them trying to, as they call it, meddle uh, into, into the elections in the other countries because this is perceived as something that's being done uh, to, uh, to Russia. So if you ask uh, to what extent they succeeded in imposing this, uh, this view of, of politics as a major uh, fight between countries and the Russian population, I think they're quite successful. Uh, well, the very idea of uh, domestic problems uh, arising from, from the inside is to a large extent discredited. That's true. This is where they are, uh, they are successful. Uh, yes, I think this is the case. But uh, if your question is about uh, the, the responsibility of, of the other agents of, of this crisis, well, I would say that uh, I don't think that uh, the NATO policies after the collapse of the Soviet Union were really responsible. Uh, I don't think it was a good idea to uh, continue with, um, with this expansion to, to the East and even to continue with NATO as it was conceived uh, during, the, during the Cold War. Well, uh, NATO was obviously conceived against the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed, it was not dissolved. It was not really repurposed. It was just expanding to, uh, to the East with a lot of hesitation, but still expanding, expanding to the East, creating this, you know, this tension in, uh, in Europe. I don't think it was a good, uh, good thing to do. But the problem with Russia is, and of course, not this, uh, this expansion. It never constituted an existential threat. NATO never had any plan of invading, uh, invading Russia. Uh, that's crazy. I mean, even now we see how weak NATO actually was uh, before before this war. Only now they are ramping up their presence in uh, in the eastern in the eastern Europe. So this is a Russian problem. This is a problem of Russia being um, not attractive to to its neighbors, and this is why they kind of tend to slip away trying to seek uh, protection from uh, from NATO. So everyone kind of contributed to this crisis back then, but the causes of uh, this war are of course uh, the, the del delusional Russian government. Thank you very much. Uh, in but order- also just, just one, one, final, one final remark. I actually think that uh, the lesson we should take from that 
is that we have to kind of reconsider when this ends. Uh, I don't know how, because it's a, I think it's a very, very dangerous situation. It could end very badly for the whole planet. But when it ends, we have to reconsider uh, the, whole, uh, the whole system of security, the whole architecture of security, I think globally, and also in Europe. And this is one probably single question which President Putin and President Zelensky completely agree. Both of them think that the, the old system is outdated, it should be replaced, and in this new Russia we will obviously be part of this replacement process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, in uh, order to conclude our event, I would ask uh, just a simple question. Can we say actually how many Russians do support war? Uh, I remember like in your um, presentations, you were uh, speaking about three parts of, 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 of the Russian society. Let's, let's, can you just describe these three slices of Russian pizza? Okay, as, as you see from my presentation, the, the question of support is the most tricky because you have always to understand what support means. The problem uh, with, you know, this, this, this is the mistake that keeps popping up. The people kind of, you know, impose the idea of support in some other country, like Japan, for instance, kind of impose the same framework on Russia, where support means a very, very different thing. Uh, uh, so I think we should be very, very careful about that, about this idea of, uh, of support, meaning that the people stands, stands behind that. But since you mentioned my uh, very... Uh, uh, inaccurate uh, and imprecise uh, idea of uh, three thirds in Russian society. Well, I would say that these three thirds were very much present already before the 2022. Uh, and one of them is uh, really quite uh, optimistic about Vladimir Putin. It is obviously older, much older. It consists most, mostly of the elderly people, but also of uh, the outright beneficiaries of, of this regime. These people uh, tend to support Putin in everything he does. If he starts a nuclear war tomorrow, they he will have a, definitely their complete support. Uh, um, they uh, are sometimes aggressive, really aggressive. They demand blood. And this is the aggressive part of Russian society. It's roughly one third, maybe a little bit more. Then you have an opposite third which now, of course, is, is silenced uh, in, in a variety of ways, which consists of younger people, more progressive people, people who uh, perceive themselves as being part of, of the global community, uh, mostly on the, in the urban centers, but not, not only in Moscow and St. Petersburg. I mean, Yekaterinburg is probably even worse for Putin than, than Moscow uh, or Novosibirsk. Um, so they form this uh, other, other extreme, also probably 20-25%. And then you have the, the huge swamp in the middle, like uh, between a third and, and a half of, of the population, which basically tries to stay as far away as possible from that. Well, if, you're, if they're really pressed, they would say, well, Putin probably knows better. If there was a uh, necessity to find those Nazis in Ukraine, well, let him, let him decide. Because I don't want to do anything with that. I don't want to have anything in common with that. I, I, who am I? I mean, I know nothing about politics. Politics is a dirty, is a dirty game. Uh, so I would like to outsource this decision to the president. If you press them like really seriously, sometimes they can become closer to this uh, first part of the population. But generally, their instinctive uh, desire is, you know, to protect their everyday life. If you want to understand something very, very basic about Russians, is just assume that the vast majority of them is tr are trying to protect their everyday lives. You don't care about Ukraine, about uh, Nazis. To be honest, even about uh, the neighboring uh, region of Russia, even about their uh, own neighbors. You want to protect their own way of life, their own routine, their own everyday life. This is what they're willing to do. If that takes a sort of symbolic uh, approval of the actions of the president, so be it, no problem. Probably he knows what he's doing. So this, I think, is, is a fair way to think of this support. The, the, the passivity, the uh, lack of idea of political responsibility is what characterizes the situation much better uh, than enthusiastic uh, support. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we are already getting out of time and uh, we received the final uh, comment on the question, thanking you for your presentation. I would uh, also want to join this comment and thank you again for your thoughtful uh, talk. And I also want to thank all the audience for your patience, for your um, participants, uh, your comments, your questions, and I hope uh, uh, this event was sort of uh, of use for uh, for many people. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, ending our session. Thank you for this invitation. It was a pleasure.